yeah, you're not kidding. It's constant. So yeah. good must have to need is the, my first go-to. And uh, because if we, we think anywhere from, you know, studies have shown 12,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day, most of them negative, most of them repetitive. So we're giving wow. ourselves the same negative message again and again and again and again, right? And the should must have to need, if we can change that and we have even, you know, 40,000 thoughts a day, that's a big change. That'll make a big effect. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of the reshape your health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and I have an exciting guest for you today. If you struggle with stress management boundaries and always putting the needs of other people ahead of your own, and it's at the expense of your own health, listen up to today's episode. I have Dr. Jane Tornator, and she's dedicated her career to helping people be kinder to themselves. Her style incorporates compassion, curiosity, deep listening, and heartfelt optimism, along with powerful shots of playfulness. She draws from her extensive professional training and wide ranging life experiences to help people release old patterns and unnecessary stress. A therapist, coach, author, and speaker based in Seattle, Local and national audiences rave about her engaging workshops on perfectionism, self-compassion, brain hacks for changing our thinking and reducing stress. Dr. Tornature received a master's degree at the University of Illinois and a PhD at the University of Minnesota. Before going into private practice, she spent two decades working in the fields of Alzheimer's, including research and working for the Alzheimer's Association. Being a geriatric PT, I find that pretty interesting, and I'm going to definitely dig into that history with her today as well. She has authored over 20 articles and published a book, which I love the title of this. Everything is perfect, just not me. A roadmap for self-acceptance. Dr. Jane, can I call you Jane? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Jane, thank you so much for coming on this show. I think that your expertise is going to resonate and connect with and help a lot of our audience. Um, As I was explaining before we hopped on here live, a lot of my audience um, are caretakers. So women, they're, they're moms, they're caretakers of their aging parents, and they really struggle with stress management and creating enough intentional margin in their own life. And then some of them also struggle with some childhood beliefs that are subconscious that they carry into adulthood that drive their actions and create this self-sabotage, self-sabotage with their weight loss unknowingly. And I've developed some tools to help them with that. But I also want our audience to really walk away with some tangible tools and tips and tricks that you've learned through your formal education and and experience to help us all just love ourselves and go a little easy on ourselves. Oh my gosh. So I'm really excited for today's conversation. Now, before we dive in, I need to know your experience with Alzheimer's. I thought that was so fascinating. And I want to know you know, you did that for a couple of decades, I think, and then pivoted into family and marriage therapy. So tell, tell us about your experience, um, working in the field of Alzheimer's research and then why you pivoted into family and marriage, uh, therapy. Right. Well, I just kind of serendipitously got into Alzheimer's strangely. Hmm. I was, um, in college, I was an English major. And then I decided I wanted to go to school to be a therapist and ac- academician and I, I had no psychology classes, like none, like not one. So I decided I should volunteer to get some experience. So I would look like, you know, kind of a qualified candidate. Uh-huh. And um, I was, so I was calling different universities and said, do you need, do you need, you know, volunteers? And the one I got set up with is one of the experts on Alzheimer's in the country. Hmm. So I did, I just started volunteering for her doing research and I, I honestly, I'm not even sure why, but I just loved working with Alzheimer's, both with the people with the disease. And actually, I think probably because they are so misunderstood 
um, yeah. because, because we lose our cognition, which is super important, and we've made it who we are as, a, as valuable, that when people lose it, we think of them as not as valuable. And that just kind of goes against my grain of, of humanity being people. Yeah. So yeah. I just, I, I wanted to figure out how to help people connect with people with Alzheimer's versus just see them as a patient who's crazy. And mm-hmm. they're still people and they still have got the essence of them there, even if they can't express it anymore. So I, that's what really, I, I've always rooted for the underdog and people with Alzheimer's are underdogs. Yeah. So that's what got me in it. So I decided I was going to study it. And then after working at it for a long time, and I was doing studies on creating screening measures and stuff, Mm -hmm. um, I, well, I loved it. And it felt like detective work to do project management and data analysis and all that. I didn't wake up in the morning feeling like I was making a huge difference in the world. Like I would publish and, you know, a few people would read it, but there was no like, oh, look at the difference I made. So when I was at one job and it was up for grant renewal, I thought, now's the time. I'm going to make a jump and I'm going to go into, I trained for family therapy, but honestly didn't have the courage to just kind of go into it because it was academia I knew. So I jumped into it and while it's a lot scarier and a lot less secure to be your own business owner, it's also so much more fulfilling because every day I see you know, how people's lives can change. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I made the leap. Interesting. So that's very fascinating to me. And thank you for all of the work that you did, um, you know, for the Alzheimer's association and that research is really important, but I'm with you. I mean, when you go to bed at night, thinking about a business dream and you wake up thinking about that same dream, I think that there's only one choice (laughs) unless we just (laughs) want to die a little bit on the inside every single day (laughs) because we're denying our passion. Um, so I, I, I think that's wonderful. And I always like connecting with other therapists and entrepreneurs too. So let's kind of dive into, I think that we should start, you, you mentioned an inhibitor, right? Yes. And I think that we should just go for it. So tell us what these inhibitors are and some common examples that you see in your patients. And maybe you can extrapolate that to some of my patient stories that we were talking about off offline. Some of my clients, what are inhibitors and what do we do about them? Awesome. So when we're trying to make a behavior change, a habit change, um, we want to do it. And it's for good reason, right? It's like, yay, this would be super healthy for me. It'd be great. Everybody says I should do it. Da, 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 da. We've got all sorts of good reasons to do it. And we end up not doing it repeatedly. Like we say, yes, I'm going to do it. We've got the intention and then we don't do it. Well, you know, you and I were talking about the the power of the the subconscious. Mm -hmm. When we, you know, want something that is healthy and we continue to not do it, there is always something in that unconscious, which is running the show. And since only 10% of our thoughts and actions are conscious, the 90% has a lot more power over what we choose to do. So if you keep trying something and it's not happening, dimes to donuts, there is some like rule or belief you have that stops you from doing it. And often it's some form of, I don't deserve it. Who do I think I am? I haven't done it before. What makes me think I can do it now? And with, uh, especially with self-care and, uh, oh, geez. Many women are taught that everybody else should be taken care of before we get to take care of our needs. It's, it's one of the rules. It's a societal rule. It's frequently a rule we see as we're growing up. It's mm-hmm. just one of those things everybody believes. Well, you know, I've worked with Alzheimer's caregivers for, you know, over 25 years now. And never once, like not once in all that time, have I worked with a caregiver to take better care of themselves? Have they come back and said, oh, Jane, now that I take more time for my self-care, I am a sucky caregiver, man. I am horrible. <laughs> I am worse than I was before I came in. Like never once. They always say I'm more patient. I'm kinder. I don't yell as much. I don't get as angry or frustrated. They are better caregivers when they you know, take even a little time to take better care of themselves. So 
the first thing to do is be the, have the awareness of what, like what comes up. Oh, I, I want to exercise more. Exercise would be super helpful. I want to exercise more. And then you think about like, if you're, um, if you want to exercise in the morning and you wake up, you think, oh, it's not worth the effort. I, I'm going to be tired. I'm so out of shape. I can't do it. If you notice that, that inhibitor of this subtle form of don't do it, it's going to be bad. Then, you know, it's something unconscious from your past that is associated with this form of self-care or really any form of self-care, but sometimes it's, you know, content specific. So uh, I'm trying to think of a, 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 my mind just went blank for client examples. Do you have one that is coming up? Well, sure. I think an easy one are people who want to eat healthier, uh-huh. right? And I'm a big fan of tracking macronutrients, not necessarily to perfection, not necessarily every awesome. day, but I think it's a great educational tool to see how much protein am I eating? How many carbohydrates, how much fat, and just to kind of educate people, especially on the importance of protein for healthy muscle Mm -hmm. to be sure that they're getting the minimum recommended amount per meal. If that's the only reason they're logging a few days a week, starting out, I'm happy, Mm -hmm. but there's a block, you know, there for, for quite a few people of, I don't want to do this because it makes me feel restricted, or I don't want to do this because I've logged in the past and I gave up on it. Or I don't want to do this because it feels heavy. It feels cumbersome. It feels like a lot of work. And so I really try to work through all of those things, but we can maybe use food logging as an example for what's a subconscious thing that could be coming up. And even if you want to just do healthy eating, (laughs) you know, not snacking at night, all these things that we work on. So one of the things that I am constantly surprised in myself and others is that we make in a subtle way, food more important than we are. Talk about that. Well, frequently what happens, and I know I used to, when I was younger, I used to diet. And then I realized every time I would diet, I would gain weight because I hated that restriction. Yeah. And so what I discovered is that when I felt like, oh, no, I, I want to be able to, you talked about popcorn in one of your episodes. Yeah. No, I want to have that popcorn. I deserve that popcorn. It's that we make, we make the popcorn more important than our health. It's, it's super subtle, but when we do not feel worthy and frequently when, when people are trying to lose weight, there's this, cause I'm not good enough with this weight on me. Mm-hmm. This. Mm-hmm. So if they are not worthy. They are not worthy of the effort it will take to restrict that popcorn or that instant pleasure. Well, I can't like what well, I'm, I'm lazy. I'm, I'm always going to, I've done it before. How many diets have I been on? I'm going to, so that's the unconscious belief of you're not worth the effort. Interesting. Your, your, this food, eating this food is more important than feeling good about yourself. The instant gratification of eating the food is more important. It's not, it's not that it's um, bad for you or anything. It's like, literally that is more important than what I want. And as you said on one thing that, you know, short, it's short-term effort for long-term gain. Mm -hmm. So we believe we're not worth the effort. And I think that is one of the most unconscious inhibitors that we have. I'm not worth this effort. I'm not worth the effort of tracking. I'm not worth the effort of you know, cooking food that my family won't like, but it's good for me. And they're going to complain. I'm not worth, like, I am not worth it. Mm -hmm. And I think to extrapolate on that, they think that making, like, they think that losing weight will make them feel more worthy. And it's almost like they're chasing their self-worth in an arbitrary number or an arbitrary clothing size. And so can you give us some insight on how we can feel worthy now no matter what the weight is, no matter how our clothes fit, no matter what the circumstance, because I know that's kind of your specialty on feeling like you're enough now and feeling like you're worthy now, and then taking place 
or excuse me, taking action from a place of positivity instead of like self guilt or shame. So talk about the difference there too. be like, where are we taking our action from? Right. So one of the best ways to discover an inhibitor and become conscious of it is to say, I am this, you know, like how people do mantras and, and affirmations and I am healthy and thin. And you say that, and if you're not feeling healthy or thin, it's automatically like, oh, I'm so lying to myself. Like we feel awful. So when you feel awful, that's like, oh, there's an inhibitor. I don't deserve to feel healthy and thin. I don't deserve to feel good about myself because I'm, I'm, I'm not healthy and thin now, right? So mm-hmm. what I like to do is when I notice, oh, that's, I completely don't believe that affirmation. Uh-huh. So then I, I, I work it until it stretches me just a little. It's like, oh, I want to believe that, but it's not like, oh, I feel bad. So, so it's, it's to get your, what you want a little more in the conscious as the inhibitors there. So when I say, oh, I, I want to be, I'm thin. Oh, no, lie. Okay. Well, I want to be thin. Yeah, I do, but I'm so lazy and I keep eating. Not still not. Okay. Well, I want to want to be thin or I want to want to lose weight or I want to want to eat healthy. So not make it so much the body size, but doing something that is healthy for us. I want to want to be healthy. Well, almost everyone, like I can't even, I can't even remember a client who, when they get to the, I want to want go, nope, can't do it. No, they're like, yeah, I do want to want. And so that activates the, 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 not the hope side, but the, and I, it activates a little bit of, I do deserve to want this. It is okay to want to want. And it's just enough where the ego is like, well, that's not, a, you can't, you can't really fail at wanting to want. So yeah. that slide. So it's all about, you know, seeing the inhibitors and working around so we can feel good about it. Yeah, I do want to want. Who doesn't feel good about wanting to want? Mm-hmm. But then where do you go from there? So after, let's say, I do want to want to make healthy choices, but they keep making unhealthy choices. So Mm -hmm. that's a great place to recognize the inhibitor. So that sounds like the first step is recognize your inhibitor, but then how do you change that inhibitor? Like what, what do you replace that with? So it's repetition. Okay. So any thought pattern is simply a neural pathway. Any belief is simply a neural pathway. So and the brain loves to go down the most uh, used neural pathways. So that's why it's easier to keep the inhibitors. I'm not worth this effort. I'm not, I'm just not worthy. I'm not. Blah, blah. So what we do is we just keep repeating. Well, I want to want. Yeah, but you just ate the donut. And I want to want to be healthier. And what I find is when we hold both the inhibitor and the want to want, and we repeat, and I do want to want. Yeah, but why did you? I know that's the self-compassion. And I do want Mm -hmm. to want, so isn't it interesting that I'm doing this and I want to want. So when we're, when we're curious, we activate the, the more creative side of our brain, the present moment, the one that can actually create more changes than the left side of the brain. So when I just keep having to people say, if you're faced with it, just keep saying, I want to want, I want to want, I want to want, I want to want until that feels so familiar that they're like, I I do want Mm. Mm -hmm. actually, actually I do. And that feels safer. So every time they're faced with it, Oh, here's the donut. And I I want to not. And then really, honestly, it doesn't matter if they eat the donut or not. They are tapping into, and I want to feel worthy. I want to feel healthy. I want to treat myself with, you know, in in a healthy, respectful, kind, caring way. So to disconnect then that donut in this case with worth, it's like, I'm eating the donut and I, and I want to want to be healthy. Mm-hmm. So we stop that, that, um, that tangle of neural pathways of donut equals bad. It's like, I want the donut and I want to want to be healthy. Great. And we hold both. And what I always find is when we hold the inhibitor and the, the desire, I want to want. Then, as you say, neural pathways fire together, wire together. As we're holding the health, what we want, and we're holding the inhibitor, that old belief that makes us feel not worthy, not valuable, then we're inhibiting, oh, I don't feel valuable. 
but I want to want to feel valuable. And we start to take that old neural pathway and bring the health firing in with it. So then we're literally changing those neural pathways of, I need to eat this donut because I feel like crap. And so this is going to make me feel better, even though it's going to make me feel crappier. It's like, right. But I, and I, I, I can't literally, we can eat the donut and want to be healthy. Like the two were not mutually exclusive, but in our not worthy brains, we make them. Does that make sense? I just kind of went on a whole ramble there. I think it makes sense. And I think the takeaway is what fires together, wires together. So the neural pathways that fire together, wire together. So maybe you go to church and you're like, I'm not going to have that donut today. I'm not going to have that donut today. And then you do have the donut today. And then you have the choice of thinking, ah, I blew it again. Like I'm such a failure. I feel so bloated. Or you have the choice to say, I want to want to be healthy, or maybe you're at the stage of, I want to be healthy. Right. And so I think that sometimes I struggle with those tools for people who want to want to, right. Because I really work with people in the action phase, like they want to, they're actively working on it. And I think, do you follow the stage, the stages of change model, like the, the pre-contemplation, the contemplation, So it sounds like this might be a really good tool for people in the pre-contemplation. Yes. Okay. When we are conscious of the inhibitors, those old beliefs of, oh, I'm just, if we can go, wow, look at that belief. Look at how I'm talking about myself. I want to want to be kinder. Like I want to not eat the donut because it's actually kinder to me. And here I am talking on. So when we're aware, we can counter it. Mm -hmm. If we're not aware, it's like breathing air. If we're aware, it's like breathing water and we're like, (coughs) oh, that feels awful. And Mm -hmm. so we can start to to change those inhibitors. Interesting. What are some other examples that you, can you think of another inhibitor example? Just, I think that's helpful with a new concept because I haven't talked about inhibitors before I talk about limiting thoughts, limiting beliefs. And I think that's a very um, parallel concept here. What are some other common inhibitors that you hear with your clients? And I know we're in a little bit different fields, so that's yeah, okay yeah. too, because I think there is some overlap there. Okay. Well, a lot of, um, the people I work with, especially the women say, I don't have time, mm-hmm. I don't have time for myself. I'm doing all this. And so one of the ways I, I help people bring up inhibitors is if they say, oh, no, I can't do that. I don't have time. It's, it's selfish of me to work out when I've got all this stuff to do for my kids and the house and my partner and my job. And I look at them and I said, okay, so if somebody else wanted to take time for exercise, would that be okay for them? I'm like, oh yeah. So it's a good thing for them to take time to exercise. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I said, but it's not okay for you. Oh no, it'd be selfish. Then I say, okay, so if that's true, if it's healthy for everybody else, but not you, then 11 times out of 10, you're breaking a family rule. You're breaking a rule that you learned often pre-verbally. Wow. Most often between, before the age of seven, like you got to put other people first by watching your parents or other people or other people at school and hearing them talk. So it just helps us to go, why is the rule different for me than everybody else? So that's the one thing I do. And then another thing I help people do is when they're in the pre-contemplation say, well, I'm the kind of person, I'm the kind of person who gets up to exercise or exercises after work or when, or let me use, use something else besides exercise. Um, Making time. I like that making time. time. I okay, think that's great. an important one. Yeah. Yeah. So even like a lot of, cause I work with a lot of very busy women, five minutes is something that's actually doable. Like it would be great to make time half an hour meditate, but five minutes is where they can start. So if they say, I'm the kind of person who takes five minutes for myself, and then you feel how that feels in your body. If you feel the inhibitor, then you're like, oh, we got more more pre-contemplation work to do here. But if you feel that, that feels really good. Like I'll give an example. I, um, pre-COVID, I had a coach on the East Coast and I would go out for the, the workshops. And so it started at eight o'clock in the morning and I'm a West coast gal. So that's super early my time. 
And I knew I felt better if I got up and took the time to exercise before the, before the workshop, because I was sitting there all day. And after we went, me and went out for dinner, so I wasn't going to exercise then. So I was talking to a friend that I was visiting beforehand and, and she's a coach and complete mindset maven. And she said, so you want to exercise, but you don't want to get up early. I'm like, yeah, I hate, it. I have to set my alarm for like three o'clock my time. It's not, I'm not worth it. Right. My feeling good is not worth it. She's like, well, why don't you say I'm the kind of person who gets up to exercise in the morning. And I went, I said it right then. And I went, oh, I got all excited. Cause that's the kind of person I want to be is the kind of person who takes the time to take care of myself. So I said it all that we were walking, I'm walk, saying it during the walk. And then I said it before I set my alarm for, you know, really super early time. I'm the kind of person who gets up to exercise. And I set my alarm and the alarm went off and I'm like, Oh no. And I'm like, I'm the kind of person who gets up to exercise. And I got up and I walked for half an hour and it was awesome. I felt so much better. I did it the same the next day. So if we can say stuff that our body buys in, then that makes a big difference. If it feel, if it makes you feel lighter or more excited or your heart goes all pitter patter, then the association of, I want to take time for myself is associated with feeling good versus that inhibitor of guilt. I don't have time. I, I should do this other stuff first. These people are waiting for this thing. I can't, it's selfish of me to take this time. I think it's important that you said to keep teasing it because if you're lying to yourself, if it feels heavy, if it feels yeah. cumbersome, then it's not going to happen. And then you're reinforcing to yourself that you're not the kind of person that follows through. It's very important what you said. And I really like to like towards an end, at the end of a coaching session or office hours, I like to kind of wrap it up and I say, how does that make you feel nice? And because if it ever feels heavy, then it's not the right action item for them. So I think I really wanted to highlight that to everyone who's looking, you know, for a program, an exercise program, like a meal plan, think about how it makes you feel. And if it makes you feel excited and light and like, this is doable, that's a good sign. If it makes you feel heavy, like I'm probably not going to do this anyways, that kind of stuff. It's a bad sign and keep teasing it out and kind of circling back to the food logging. I asked one of my members, you know, Oh, you said that you were going to log. Why didn't you log? She's like, I just, I didn't want to do it every day. And I'm like, who said you have to do it every day, right? Maybe just log one meal a day. Maybe just log, log one meal a week yeah. and what feels good to you. And I think that's where people have to take action from versus thinking there's this magic plan or program or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so I think those are both two really helpful things. Um, so want to want to, and then keep kind of teasing it back and saying, I, I, I'm the kind of person that gets up early and does whatever, or I'm the kind of person that logs their food, or I'm the kind of person that makes healthy choices. And yeah. so influencing our actions from that belief, I think is a very powerful thing. And I wanted to pivot and talk about perfectionism. Um, a long time ago, I had an, uh, an emotional eating expert on the show. And she said that perfectionism is actually a trait in emotional eaters. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So she said that they spend so much of their time and energy trying to please other people that they don't have very much left for themselves. And it makes them more susceptible to turning to food to kind of cope with their stress of perfectionism. So will you kind of talk a little bit about your best pieces of advice for someone who really struggles with mm -hmm. perfectionism hands up? Like if you're listening to the podcast, uh, Jane, nice hand there, they are up right now. We are probably <laughs> both recovering perfectionists. Absolutely. <laughs> and a couple of things that have helped me is just start like Marie Forleo says, start before you're ready progress over perfection. And like literally repeating those things over and over yes. and taking action and experiencing that the negative repercussions that I thought would come from taking action before something was perfect um, or maybe turning in an assignment that wasn't perfect mm -hmm. or not doing perfect documentation that nine times out of 10, whatever negative consequence or reaction I thought I was going to get doesn't happen. Right. And so it's like, I was making up these stories in my head 
about what would happen if I wasn't perfect. And then once I kind of confronted the fact that those are made up stories and not real, Mm -hmm. it allowed me to give myself more grace to do things imperfect, imperfectly. But what are some things that you've, you know, done for yourself and that you help your clients to deal with that perfectionism that is very common in women? Well, I just thought of two right away that are some of my favorites and they're tools I use constantly. So perfectionists frequently learn to motivate themselves by demanding, I have to do this. I need to do this. I should do this. I got to do this. And when you stop and think about how that feels in your body, like, is there something you, you should be doing or, or it's on your plate and you need to do, you have something. Um, okay. This is a great example. Perfect example. Um, I'm rebranding just as we speak. Congratulations. Thank you. From weight loss for health to Zivli. And it's going to be a big project. It's going to be probably a little expensive. Um, and I could wait until everything was done. Right. And I decided, I decided, no, you can't, because for me, it's hard to think of steps three and four mm-hmm. until step one is taken care of. Right. And so I knew I was going to be expending a lot of my, um, energy thinking about steps three and four, when I just had to execute step one first. And that was, um, the domain as we talk, I mean, this is a few months before this is going to air, but as we talk, my website's not working because the, the URL transfer is taking place and that can take five to seven days. And for an online business to have a website down, it's not ideal, but I'm overcoming that perfectionist mindset. And I'm just like, you know what? It's okay. My members are big on grace and I only received positive feedback. Not one person came back and said, your website's down. Why can't I get in your program? Any of those thoughts didn't happen. So that's a really good example of me right now is there's probably a task list of a hundred items for a rebrand. Awesome. And I took step, I took the first step this week. Yay. Yay. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank so you. Now let's um, say, is there, is there a step that's stressing you out? Great. So say I have to do whatever, you don't have to say it out loud, but say, I have, to, I have to do this, this next step. I have to do this next step. I have to figure out who's going to help me with the rebrand. Great. Close your eyes. Find an agency. And what does your body feel like when you say that? My, my chest tightens up. Mm -hmm. My tummy gets a little tingly. My hands get a little sweaty. Part of this is because I know people might be watching on you. I know. (laughs) Which is fine. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, I think that my eyes get a little fluttery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now say it would be helpful for me to find the whatever. Um, what do you mean? Like it would be helpful for me. Like it would be helpful for me to find a a professional. Yeah. Or a big, good idea for me to find a professional to help. It would be a good idea for me to find someone who's actually good at this. Awesome. (laughs) Excitement. Yeah. I feel it's almost like the, the jitteriness in my stomach turned to butterflies. Yes. So when we, especially as perfectionists, we say, oh, I got to do this. I have to do this. We automatically create tension because what we're saying to ourselves unconsciously is, if you have to do it and you haven't done it already, you're a failure. You're already failing. Just mm-hmm. even thinking about it, you are creating the sense of failure and dread. So why would we do something, neurons that fire together to wire together, why would we do something that is associated with failure and dread? We're going to put it off, mm-hmm. right? Because perfectionism is very related to procrastination. So when we say something like it'd be helpful or it'd be a good idea, I'm like, you're only saying what's true. It mm-hmm. is a good, it would be a good idea to get people to help you. Yay. But then you can get behind the excitement. You're saying the same thing. Only now it's, a, now it's associated with, wow, yeah, that's, that's actually, I would like that. That's true. So it feels better. And so we're more yeah, likely yeah. to do something if it feels better. So, so if we relate that to health, cause I always like to bring that back. So maybe someone's like, Oh, I need to get healthy. I should get healthy. Right. I should do this. I should clean up my diet. You're suggesting that sit, like I call it shitting all over yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that just pre presumptuously makes them feel like a failure. And it's more helpful to say, 
But if you want to find the inhibitors, if there are some say, I want to get healthy. And then if you feel like crap, you're like, oh, I got some inhibitors there to work uh -huh. through. Then gotcha. if that's too much, then you say, it'd be a good idea. Because we can almost always get behind. It would be a good idea because it, it's on our list for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the first thing is I would eliminate should, must, have to, need, and um, um, use it'd be a good idea or it'd be helpful. Um, the second thing I do for people who are perfectionists and the procrastination that comes along with it is if I'm avoiding something or I'm dreading it, I will set my timer for 15 minutes and I will sit down and I make myself a promise. If it feel, still feels this awful to think about it 15 minutes in, I'm going to stop the task. Almost always our resistance is worked through in 15 minutes and then we're doing it and the, the negative associations with it aren't there anymore. So then, cause we're, cause we're doing it. We're taking the right. action. Our ego is like, well, this isn't so bad. I'm this, I'm doing okay so far. So then we can keep going. What's an example of that for your own life? I'm just curious. Oh, paperwork. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, paperwork is not my happy place. It, it'd be good. It'd be helpful to have a mindset shift on that. But yeah. I don't, I like, I see a pile of paper. I'm like, Ugh. so I will set my timer for 15 minutes and just work through the first couple of pieces. And then after that, I'm like, oh, I'm, I can do this. I'm fine. But That's really helpful. Oh, it so is. But I also make myself the promise that if it, if it feels as bad as I'm my pre-contemplation, I will stop after 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's happened twice in 15 years. But giving yourself that choice, like to stop, if you want, I've done that at the gym before. Um, I'm really big on taking action. Even if you don't want to, if you said you were going to do it, you better do it. Like, that's how I, uh -huh. that's how I live my life is I really try to make commitments that feel doable when I make yeah. them, but then follow through. And so one day I went to the gym and I swear to you less than 15 minutes later, I walked out and my first thought was, that was not a good workout today. And then my next thought was, but you came, you know, and you followed <laughs> through and that's good enough for today. It's almost like you're, you're strengthening your, your discipline and your self-control as much as you are strengthening your muscles to do whatever you want to do. Yep. Um, and you're also creating neural pathways in the brain with that, because one of the things that um, helps our brain learn new things and create new neural pathways is acetylcholine. And acetylcholine responds with uh, punishment, reward, and importance. And so what you did oh. with that, if you walked out after, but I did it, you basically gave your brain and your unconscious and conscious the message of, I did it. Yay me. You mm -hmm. gave yourself a reward. You celebrated the importance of taking that action for yourself. So your brain is like the acetylcholine is like, right. Learn that exercise is a good, we get a reward when we exercise. Yay, let's do it more. So you've now made it more possible to do in the future. Whereas if you would have left 15 minutes, like, I'm such a failure. Oh, why did I leave? What a loser. You would have wired that in. So these little moments of celebration are so important for creating habit change in our brain. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I don't know if you've read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. I'm a huge fan of that. And he has influenced me to help coach my members to make following your system, your goal, because you're never completely in charge of whatever number you see on any right. scale or paper, but you are in charge of how you act during the day. Yes. And if you can just do those one to three priority action items and get that little acetylcholine hit from following yeah. your system, yeah, that's so much more important and rewarding than like celebrating what once a month or once a week when you step on the scale. Yeah. You know, what are, what are you rewarding? I think that's a really good question that we weren't really planning, but what are you rewarding? Right. Isn't that an interesting thought? What are you rewarding? That's and if people, can, yeah. And then people, well, what am I rewarding? What I like to think too, about how much of your energy, emotional energy is being drained from unproductive thoughts or from, you know, thoughts about stress that you're not in control of, or step, like I was talking about steps three, four, and five, instead of just rechanneling right. that step <laughs> one. Oh my gosh. Uh, take my own advice there. And I think that's a nice kind of pivot from the perfectionism. We also wanted to talk about stress today. 
Um, I'm sure that you've studied the, the physiological effects of stress, but I am so big on reducing your metabolic stress, your mental stress, your physical stress, optimizing what we can to bring the cortisol down. Cause then we can bring our glucose down and our insulin down. And that's really where we see those health benefits. Mm. And I think I wanted to pick your brain about, you had somewhere on your website, um, what was it? Unintended stress or unconscious stress, things that you really help your clients work through. What are your best tips to identify and manage stress? Cause it's a awesome. big barrier. Yeah. You're not kidding. It's constant. So yeah. good must have to need is the, my first go-to. And, uh, because if we, we think anywhere from, you know, studies have shown 12,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day, most of them negative, most of them repetitive. So we're giving wow. ourselves the same negative message again and again and again and again, right? And the should, must, have to, need, if we can change that and we have even, you know, 40,000 thoughts a day, that's a big change. That'll make a big effect. If we can get rid of those, those words mm -hmm. that literally create stress and change them to words that make us feel like, oh, that actually, I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm curious about how that's going to, wow, how's that going to work, right? So should, must, have to, need is first. The second thing I like to do is literally reset our system into the sympathetic or the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic. So there's an exercise I read in a book from a guy based in Denmark, and it's called the basic exercise. And it is the fastest way to activate the parasympathetic. So what you do is you cross your you know, fingers, like, I don't know how to describe, how would you describe this for the people who can't see? Um, interlace your fingers, interlace your fingers. And if you're driving, drive with your knee. No, just kidding. Do this when you're not driving. <laughs> right. Not like I've ever done that. <laughs> so interlace your fingers. Okay. And then put your hands behind the, the round part of your head, put your hands behind the round part of your head. Okay. And let your head relax into your hands now. So your neck is straight and I'll okay. say why this is important after we do it. But now keeping your head straight, move just your eyes and I'll do mirror image to the left until you yawn, swallow or sigh. Hey, and that just head. happened automatically. Right? Exactly. Right. Okay. Huh. Now then move your eyes to the right until you yawn, swallow or sigh. <sighs> and your head's drifting a little bit. Everybody's drifts a little bit to the, the second side. And yawning, swallowing, and sighing are all symptoms of the parasympathetic activating because rest, digest, heal is a parasympathetic. So why this works is putting your, um, your hands behind your head and letting your hand re head relax. When we think a stressful thought, when we're in a stressful situation, our C1 and C2 vertebrae shift just a little to shift blood flow to the amygdala. Because if we're, there's stress, there's danger. So we don't want to be thinking our free frontal, prefrontal cortex of like, huh, what's happening here? Do you hear something? No, we want to be acting, right? So your, your system shuts off blood flow to the rest of your brain. Mm -hmm. This position of your hand relaxing, your, your head relaxing in your hands shifts the C2 and C1 vertebra back open so your whole brain gets the blood. So right away, you've got more of your brain on board. Now, the moving your eyes to left and to the right, keeping your head straight, for some reason, well, not for phys physiologically, apparently, uh, and I know just enough to be dangerous on this, the eye muscles, when you move them, somehow activate the ventral vagal nerve, you know, the biggest parasympathetic nerve thing. So you are getting blood flow to all your brain mm -hmm. and you're activating your parasympathetic and oh i see okay so i do it with every i start it with every client session really yeah mm. because we are constantly put into sympathetic our phone dings somebody says you know when somebody says jane barbara and i'm like uh, you know we get everything puts us off into into high alert 
So you know what else I thought there too, was it assists in diaphragmatic breathing, which we know is great for our parasympathetic. I think I'll just hang out here. (laughs) It makes me think of, I know this is bad, but like of some guy after he eats a big meal and he goes, Oh, you know, and then he kicks his feet up. It's intuitive. (sighs) It is kind of intuitive. So almost that, um, post meal position where we lean back, we relax, but then to trigger that, then the parasympathetic system, even more look to the left, wait for a yawn, swallow or sigh, correct. Look to the right. And then I would add, breathe into your belly. Yes. Open up that chest and come back down. So that's a really good, um, will you say that little cute little phrase that should have to must have to need should, must have to have need. To need. Yeah. I would love for all of us to do a thought audit and be a little bit more conscious of our thoughts and, you know, walk around with like a post-it or a piece of paper should, must have to need, and literally tally out, tally up how many times we start a thought with one of those. And then that's a nice representation of perhaps, um, an unintentional stress thought that then we can change to, eh, wouldn't it be nice if I did this? Yeah. Or, that sounds like a good idea. So something a little bit less stress invoking. That's yeah. a great tip. Second tip was, uh, I'm going to call it the full guy position. <laughs> <laughs> the full guy position. Um, what are some other great little stress identification and management things you like? I read a book uh, called Burnout. I forget the whole type it was Emily and her sister Nagoski. It's so good. I wish I could remember the title, but anyway, they said something that was brilliant. They said, our body doesn't speak word language. It speaks body language. So they talk about completing the stress cycle and it's letting our body know you're done. There's no danger. You're safe. And so there are several things that let our body know, you know, we're done. Crying completes the stress cycle. Physical activity completes the stress cycle. Because you're not going to be lifting weights or going for a walk if there's danger. So you're letting your body know, oh, it's okay. You can be outside. You can be moving. You can be doing stuff. Um, you, You are physically, literally safe. Another one that I frequently use, because I'm, I'm not always going to want to cry and I'm not always going to have time for exercise, but I literally do animal shaking. When animals are done being chased in the wild, they don't go around the rest of the day going, oh my God, did you see that fox? The fox almost got, did you see that? Oh my God, almost. No, they're just like, they shake it off and then they go back to eating or whatever once they're safe. Jane, so I need sorry. to see your animal shake. Your be- give me your best animal shake. <laughs> okay, so you just literally I shake for like 30 seconds and I, I will stamp my feet and just shake my whole body. I hope you guys are watching on YouTube. This is a fantastic animal shake. <laughs> and it feels awesome. I'm going to do that. And it's letting your body know you're safe now. And mm-hmm. especially if, if somebody yells at me or something really like, really stressful happens. It feels so much better because we're, we're releasing the cortisol and adrenaline out of our system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like with the breath, only it's a little more active and a little more visceral. And we can like, nobody finishes shaking and says, Oh, I feel worse. Like nobody ever. Cause we just literally shook out the stress because our bodies hold the tension to this. So it's awesome. That's a great, I have never heard of that. Any other what is it called? Completing the stress cycle. Completing and you said, cycle. um, crying, exercising the animal shake, any other ones that you can think of? I think breathing, although for breathing, some breathing works really well for some people. And for some people, it just seems to increase their stress. So if breathing works, especially with the belly doing a longer exhalation, because when we inhale, we activate the sympathetic and we exhale, we activate the parasympathetic. So you do longer out breathing. You're literally putting your system more in the rest, digest, heal than the, oh my God, I'm going to freak out. It's true. No. So from my PT background, we know the pulse rate and your blood pressure 
goes up on an inhale down on an exhale. So if you're in the doctor's office and you want to get that low blood pressure right. reading, <laughs> exhale if while they are deflating the cuff and you'll get a better blood pressure reading while so, they're deflating. Awesome. Thank you. While they're deflating the cuff. Um, so I have to give a shout out to, mo- to one of my members. You don't because, have to. Um, she, you want to me- know. Oh yeah. See how often that happens. If anyone just caught that, the must have to should need need see how often that happens. So I want to give a shout out to one of my members who during a coaching call, she kind of caught me off guard. And now I, I can see the, the physiology behind it. She said, Morgan, I had, you know, a stressful, I think it was maybe a work trip or like a, a leadership development thing that took quite a bit of emotional energy. And she said, so I don't know if it was this morning or like before work, she goes, I watched a sad dog movie just to make myself cry. Awesome. Isn't that brilliant of her? You know, so her body just knew that she needed to release that stress. And she said, I felt so much better. And I had never heard of that before. And it made me think of her when you said, sometimes to complete the stress cycle. So to complete that kind of stress cycle of that, that weekend. And she cried, she watched a sad dog movie. Yeah. Uh, It's awesome. (laughs) I just, I had to get, I I wanted to give her a shout out. Yeah. Um, so I want to write those down. I hope that everyone understands that I have an obsession with learning. It's one of my top five strengths. And this is definitely one thing I do want to do, and I want to follow through. So this is the action item that I'm giving myself. So should we're going to say them again, should, should must, need, must have to have to need. I'm going to do a thought audit at least. I, I even think for like an hour or two, and you would probably find some of these. Oh yes. you. Will. I would challenge anyone who's going to listen to this episode or watch on YouTube to do a thought audit. I, I literally wrote it out on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. I'm going to carry it around and I'm going to tally how many times I say something because I feel like I'm in a pretty good headspace most of the time. Absolutely. And I think this, um, this will help identify some of my own limiting thoughts and my own limiting beliefs that yeah. honestly, sometimes there are blind side. That's where coaching can really help is helping us identify our own blind side. And one last question I had for you is I have heard that the 10 minutes before we go to sleep and then our first thoughts right in the morning are really important to help retrain our subconscious. I wanted to know if you ascribe to that same line of thought. I do. Yeah. Because when we go to sleep, you know, once again, neurons that fire together, wire together. I've got a gratitude practice that I do first thing in the morning before I get out of bed, I feel gratitude because mm-hmm. I'm a perfectionist. And when I created a list, like list of the things I would critique my list, like really Jane, you named your cats again. Can't you be more, you know, so I would just, I wouldn't feel good. So I just felt gratitude and I, I can do that. There's no perfectionism with that. Right. So when you do it in the morning, you are literally firing those neural pathways And once we're firing neural pathways, they're ready to be fired again. Hmm. So if you start your morning with gratitude or love or just calm or peace or something, or I want to, I'm so excited about getting stuff done today. If if you want to get a lot of stuff, or I'm so excited about being healthy today. um, If if that makes you feel good, then you are cueing your brain. Oh, this is important. And do this more today. You're literally firing the neural pathways, making them more able to fire. At night, it's super powerful because once again, neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, I, when I think thoughts of gratitude in the night before I go to sleep, my brain is during the night, you know, processing all the experiences, filing them away, filing like with like. If you're firing gratitude neural pathways, how your day will be categorized and sorted in your brain will be infused with gratitude. Mm. So you will look back and go, oh, that was so, that was a rough test, but you know, I'm so glad I got through it. Mm-hmm. I got through, yay me. That was such a hard thing I did, but I did it. I'm so, so instead of going, oh my God, that was awful. It's like, it was awful, but I did it. I'm so proud of myself. 
So mm -hmm. gratitude will be infused. So in the morning, it sets us for how we perceive the day. At night, it sets us up for how we will see our life in the past. Interesting. Oh, you've really um, inspired me, obviously, to take some action and continue to uncover my own limiting thoughts. But I hope that our audience got a lot of tips and tricks and different mindset hacks. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And can you let our audience know where they can connect with you more? Yes. My website is everydaylove.me. And I have a thing um, called intuitive decision making that really helps people learn how, you know, to really notice how their thoughts feel and how to make decisions that feel good, not just be so confused and not be able to make decisions. So if you go to everydaylove.me slash body test, it's a, I'll send you a really simple video and, and a PDF on how to start learning to trust your own inner knowing versus this constant questioning we have going on in our brains. Very important. We, we talked about that actually today in office hours on um, a member just really feeling more confident and trusting herself. You know, yes. she said, I think, and I, I think I read on your website too, that when we don't feel confident in ourselves and when we don't feel like enough self-love or self-worth, then we always seek that external validation Yes. when else saying that we're making the right decision. Yep. So I will be sure to link up all of those great resources. Awesome. Jane, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been delightful, Morgan. Thank you so much. Of course. We'll talk soon.